This is Garvey Alexander, and you're listening to Liquid Legacies. Cheers. I'm Garvey Alexander, and this is Liquid Legacies. I'm here with Angela and Isabel. They're representing Don Papa Rum. It's the first single island premium distilled rum from the Philippines, and we're going to learn things about the culture, the Filipino culture, about how it's distilled. We're going to learn the inner workings of Don Papa Rum. By the time you're finished with this podcast, you're going to have a way better understanding of rum. And these two are here to guide us. Um, so the term single island rum, like, I, I mean, it's rarely used. Can you, can you fill us in on what that means, single island rum? Yeah. You want to take it? <laughs> yeah, so single island rum basically just means that um, all of our sugar cane and our production is done on a single island because the Philippines is made up of many, many islands. But the island that we are from is Negros. Oh, great. Are you actually from that island as well or just like a, a, a neighboring island? Yeah, I, I was born here. My parents are from the Philippines, but they are from Manila and Camarines Norte. So not Negros, but it's still, you know, home. Oh, cool. And where are, are you um, a New York native or are you... I am. I am not uh, by way of the Philippines, <laughs> so I'm by way of Westchester. Um, I've lived here for uh, pretty much all my life with a short stint in Miami. Um, oh, cool. I've always had a drawing to rum and spirits in general. So, Do you mind filling us in on, like, your roles um, at Don Papa and, like, just what you do? Sure, yeah. So I'm the managing director for North America. Mm -hmm. So I have uh, basically the commercial and marketing um, ambition every year that yeah. we have to develop um the brand was started obviously from the philippines but our our core office is in london mm -hmm. and so good perfect okay. great um so our our headquarters is in london and it's quite a large brand in europe and throughout so we sort of translate the brand plans from uh, the UK to something a little bit more manageable here in the US. Okay. So Izzy is the jack yeah. of all trades. Jack of all <laughs> trades. Um, so just yeah. what does that entail in, in your five years with Don Papa? So I started off with the tastings program. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going into liquor stores, doing the demos to try and get people to taste it and uh, just kind of spread the word, the awareness. And then natural transition from there went into off-premise sales which then expanded into on-premise sales as well and then during the pandemic that switched to e-commerce mm. um and then from there kind of got into marketing which involves anything from pr events digital um social did i say that but yeah 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 so you were with Don Papa. You've been with Don Papa for five years. How long has this brand just been like in? How, when was it conceived? Yeah, like when not did it that, start? Not that long ago. So only mm -hmm. just about ten years ago. Wow. Um, so it's been a pretty short journey in in terms of mm -hmm. you know how long it actually takes to build brands and get it to that consumer level. Mm -hmm. um, and then we should probably mention we very recently were just acquired by Diageo, so it yeah. is a Diageo owned brand now. Um, yeah, but it yeah. was a, a little brand that could with our three founding <laughs> members. Wow. Um, and so that short amount of time to go from inception to acquisition in just 10 years is really quite astounding. It really is. Yeah. Um, and especially for, you know, for being the founders being only three people, usually yeah. liquor brands can have five to, you know, five founders, even more. Yeah, you know. I, th I think they had a, a series of investors, but there oh, was okay. definitely just, you know, the three active, uh, Stephen AJ and Monica. And, um, you know, it's been the same team since it started. Obviously, it's grown. I've only been with them for about two years, easy five years. Um, but everyone is still part of the team. And it really is, as cheesy as it sounds, one big family and mm -hmm. one big Filipino American yeah. family. Yeah. Um, and they certainly know how to treat people and have a lot of fun. And it's been a, a really great journey for them. And I was so happy to hear the acquisition. They absolutely deserved it. For someone with your background and kind of um, having the pulse um, on marketing, you know, globally, uh, nationwide and globally, 
what's the first step that you, maybe like the first bit of advice or the first step that a brand should take if they want to reach that level you yeah. know come uh, come from like a mom and pop to being acquired by a, a huge umbrella yeah. company like Diageo? It's a great question. Um, I think, you know, in our case and what I've seen, this is actually the second brand I've worked on that was acquired by a large multinational. Um, and with both of those brands, particularly with Don Papa, you have to have a strong creative vision. Mm -hmm. And um, Stephen and AJ just created this really rich, robust visual world mm -hmm. of Sugarlandia. So he had the vision of, you know, it comes from the island of Negros and it's really beautiful and Mount Canlon volcano is there. But what does that look like from a fantastical perspective? Mm -hmm. And so he just created this mystical world that the rum sort of transform into and you can see it on the packaging. So, I mean, obviously you need to have the right liquid. Your packaging has to be effective. But when you can create, you know, a strong visual world and a creative world that can pivot, you know, depending on trends and, you know, just kind of become timeless, but also become very creative. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what attracts the multinationals, right? Something that you can't just put a formula on. It's got to have yeah. that artist sort of feel to it. Absolutely. Yeah. The spirit. The, the, spi the, the spirit, spirit of the spirit. The spirit yes. of the spirit. Yeah. And I think, um, as you said, the packaging and the label actually resonates. Um, can you maybe offer some some insight to the packaging and how this relates to the Philippines? Because sure. before, like just off a of first glance, it reminds me of a, a bill. It kind of reminds me of like a a dollar, a currency. Of a, a currency. Yeah. I'm not too sure what the currency of the Philippines is now. Maybe you can fill that in and fill me in on that. But wow, look how unique this is, honestly. Um, so maybe you can offer some insight into to like who this is and is this like a Filipino style of of uh, art or is it just like is it modeled after a bill or yeah i think it it's it really sort of transcends um geography right so you look at this and it's you know to your point like is it a currency where is it from it, it has that sort of um mystical and um discoverable uh feel to it there actually is, I'll let Izzy speak to the history of it, but there there is a story behind the gentleman on the on the label. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. Looks that's... really cool. Looks like a, a Filipino Monopoly man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, with his monocle. But he has a literal iguana as a monocle. Like how epic is that? With yeah. Like Yoda. Yeah, and that's his... that <laughs> that rich visual world that, you know, the the team has had, you know, discovered that can have so much life to it. But this is a, a rendition mm -hmm. of, um, in our mind, uh, a nod to a gentleman called Papa Isio. And I'll let mm. you explain just the Yeah, who's Papa Isio? It. Yeah, Papa Isio was actually um, a sugarcane sugar farmer in the Philippines mm -hmm. who helped lead uh, Negros to independence. Oh, wow. So he was a revolutionary, and kind of that's where this whole spirit of Don Papa idea came from a little bit of uh, independence and Absolutely. innovation and mm -hmm. leadership um, but going back to the whole bottle I don't even know where to begin um, <laughs> as you mentioned there's the the monocle which yeah, is so an animal cool. there's a his mustache his necktie if you look there's all these different little animals and insects that are native to the Philippines so Oh, I Every see. Every detail really is inspired by the Philippines. And honestly, I'm going to tell you one thing. I would hate to see this in my backyard. I don't know if you guys <laughs> see this right here, but whatever this is, I, I do not want to see this in my backyard. <laughs> this is the scariest animal I've ever seen in my life. This is like a raccoon and a dog <laughs> yeah. and, a, and a tiger mixed together. Yeah. But we'll just keep them on the label. You know, yeah, I, yeah. I do love it on the label, <laughs> yeah. and I do love that the label is so eye-catching, and there's something for you to, it's intricate, there's something for you to, to like, view at every corner, and there's a lot of detail as well, and then just for the functionality of it, it can fit in the well of a bar, it will go well, uh, great on the shelf as well, you can grab, it's, you know, I'm, I can palm this in my hand, which means I can pour very fast, so functionality-wise, it's a plus and then just for you know label design it's extremely unique and it's 
eye-catching, honestly. The red really pops. The blue is nice and subtle. It reminds me of a currency. I love money. So, like, <laughs> I love uh, rum. So, you're really speaking to me. And then I do love how you have a revolutionary on here. You have all of these animals that are um, indigenous to the area as well. So, it's really speaking to me honestly um also if you think just like the shape of the bottle we're we're pretty used to seeing the stout shape when it comes to whiskeys mm -hmm. even gins not so usual for rums right so yeah, if you think true. about that this has been around for 10 years it's really taking a, a page in the premium bottling labels mm -hmm. all of that um and really just kind of forces you to think a, a bit differently about rum like not yeah. in that tall cylinder you know standard yeah, it's stock usually bottle. in a large uh long cylinder yeah. bottle exactly. this is quite different yeah. and that's one thing i think you guys stand out when it comes down to the, uh, the creative and the art side of it and as well as being a distinctly different flavored of of rum like something that when i tasted it it stood out immediately so um but I just want to double back to the art um, before we even get into the taste and the flavor notes and whatnot, because I also have a cocktail shaker here from Don Papa, and it's probably one of the most unique cocktail shakers that I've ever been, uh, that has ever been sent to me. And um, I just want to show you guys really quick. This is not even a plug. This is like, <laughs> this is like really go out and check this out because they're, I assume these animals are also indigenous to, um, to the Philippines as well. Yeah, there's a lot of so flora cool. and fauna on there as well. So cool. So there's like engravements. You can literally run your finger through these and, and feel the engravements inside. It's beautifully crafted as well. I love that. So this is what, a 16-ounce shaker or, or um, something like that? I, it, a little bit larger than that. I think it's, yeah, 32, maybe the, this, the smaller one, yeah. This and is like 16. Standard, yeah, like standard shaker. shaker yeah. So I, yeah. I had a little Dom Papa before, so I'm not too sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is really cool. Honestly, I think it's worth uh, having in your collection at home um, if you want something that's unique. Everybody has the same shaker. Everybody has a silver tin shaker. How about get something that's engraved and and uh, with all of these beautiful indigenous animals, indigenous to the Philippines? Like that's really cool. And there's a lot of floral on this as well. So I'm digging it. I'm digging your guys' style. Oh, honestly, that's great. Yeah, well, you mentioned it. art. It's actually a big part of our brand DNA. So um, every year we do a canister. Uh, project uh, mainly in Europe um, but we do we've had had it in in the US before um, and we basically commission artists we run like a uh, art um, program and a contest at the end of you know the, the program and and the winner is actually on the canister for that year oh my gosh and we've got really? a series of collections of them yeah that's so cool they were going for I think on like the auction uh, that we saw just over the weekend, like the whole collection for something insane, like 2,500 pound per canister, with the bottle included, of course. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, really just speaks to having that creative world be part of our DNA and also why you came to learn of us uh, in collaborating with Here Lies Love and the, the Broadway show, Filipino oh, Broadway show. Such a good show. Yeah. I've seen it. I've seen Here Lies Love two times already. Um, wow. Uh, both times. I was knocked out of the water. I really love this Broadway show. I suggest you guys go see it. Hopefully it runs for from now until forever. But it's the it's it's historical as well. It's the yeah. first uh Broadway show that's is what is it? All, all Filipino, Filipino cast. All Filipino cast. Insane. Yeah. And Making history. About Filipino history right. too. Yeah, but yeah. you never really, you know, have heard of it. So are they are, is like Don Papa the official like sponsor of Here Lies Love or something like that? We sponsor their opening night party. Mm -hmm. Um they do offer Don Papa at the bar, but for yeah. us it was just a way of sort of supporting our Filipino, you know, castmates really, you yeah. know, and and just being so proud of having the world stage for the Filipino audience, you know. Mm -hmm. Um it, there's an interesting sort of disconnect between the U.S. from a, an American perspective between the U.S. and the Philippines. It's, you know, not like any other South Asian um, country. And there's a tie to the U.S. There's a Spanish influence. Mm -hmm. 
there's, I think Filipinos are the second largest Asian community in the United States. We'll have to fact check yeah that. yeah we can but, fact check that do you mind fact checking that for me <laughs> but That's there great. is um yeah i mean there's a large filipino you know uh, presence for sure presence in Absolutely, the u.s and it's yeah. like i just learned about the history of the philippines when you know i started working on the brand and then for a broadway show to actually have you know the the filipino history and all filipino cast it's like yeah. really amazing so i think we could use as americans a little bit more um education into you know our, our filipino counterparts than what we've absolutely. really been exposed to absolutely and then um, i i learned a lot from just going to that broadway show because it is like uh going through the history of yeah. of you know the president uh marcos yeah. president marcos and his wife and do you think that that's why that's why you guys were able to introduce a rum and create a rum 10 years ago because maybe like the turmoil of those events kind of died down a bit and you were able to do that like what's the climate like when you like what was the climate like when you were creating this and as to now and versus then you know like is it well received or was there a lot of pushback because of the political turmoil in the country during that time I, this is a great question i think my knowledge of the history is a little bit limited i i think you know for the most part the philippines has been seeking independence pretty much their entire lives mm -hmm. right and i think um the filipino independence day in in june mm -hmm. um is really only how long have, has the philippine had pure independence and not colonialized mm, not in, not I think very it was long. the 80s because yeah. 80, in in at the end of here lies love they have that song that the protesters sang and they said exactly. it was like the 80s when, yes. yeah. when they sang so i think it kind of makes sense that you know they really like really fought really hard and yeah. and then got that independence i guess in the late 80s and early 90s and then boom about 20 years later this amazing rum is is being born and then 10 years after that it's hitting the u.s market yeah. it kind of makes sense with the timeline for yeah. me where it's like we had to fight you know we're we're, we're st everybody's still fighting even 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 outside of the philippines i mean there's so many other places in the world still fighting for their independence and this uh, their ability to produce their own materials and make their own profit and and raise their own value and there's a lot of countries that are going through that now but it makes sense that you know got out of this dictatorship i guess and then moved on to more of a, a democratic situation out there like i'm not too sure about the political climate and i'd love to to know a bit if you if you know anything about that what's going on i well, i would say i definitely would say that yes let don papa can exist because of that that fighting spirit mm, yeah philippines for sure has had a very long history of fighting for our independence um but Again, coming back to the show, Here Lies Love, I think what a lot of people didn't realize before seeing the show, you know, they did make a big political statement mm -hmm. at the end saying, this is happening again. Yeah. So really, um, we have to fight still. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you f are, do you know if there are like challenges that you're facing now when it comes down to exporting and uh, maybe like getting the product from the philippines to america or no we've, it... we've not had any sort of government constraint i actually just the opposite i think working with you know yeah. the filipino government has been fairly turnkey well great yeah um, positive absolutely positive yeah there's but a lot of value in, with with that with yeah, creating they love a what product. Yeah. is happening you know and and we are we were the first premium rum to come out of the philippines we're not the last so yeah. there are others um, which I think just speaks to, you know, the need to have, you know, great spirits come out of the country. And why not? There's hundreds of Caribbean rums, right? So yeah, there's absolutely. certainly space. There are hundreds of Caribbean rums, yes. but this stands out. It's unique to itself. Um, aged in, in oak. Yeah, ex-bourbon. Aged in ex-bourbon barrels, which is, so it gives it a nice uh, toasty oaky flavor, a, a hint of it, right? Yeah. Maybe you can guide me through a pour. I'm going to pour a little <laughs> bit for myself. Would you like a pour as well? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so I'm breaking the seal. That's a good sound. 
That was great. Thank so how you. about you just kind of let us know um, kind of the aroma, the flavor, and, and whatnot. Thank you so much. And guys, if you are seeing this and you don't have any Don Papa, you can pause this. You can run out. You can go grab some. <laughs> come back. Do what you need to do. Go we to the do bathroom. You sell on our website. You can settle on the website. I'm sure it's on Drizzly and everywhere else. Yep. Then you can grab your two uh, fingers length and join us. And we're about to get a official tasting going right now. So hit us off. Let us know what we're, go what for we're it. doing. Okay. So, I mean. Channel your inner tasting days. Right. And I apologize, guys. We're <laughs> drinking out of julep glasses today. We're not rocks glasses. But these are Basquiat glasses. So it is what it is. Very You'll beautiful. just have to trust me. It's a beautiful amber color. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful amber color. Great. But the first thing you'll notice like as soon as you open the bottle, even before you pour it, there's that big vanilla aroma. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, back in the tasting days, <laughs> I remember a lot of people would come in and say, oh no, I don't drink rum, and wouldn't want to taste it. And I just crack open the bottle, and I'd be like, are you sure? And they're like, what does that smell? <laughs> <laughs> so true. Mm. But yeah, so you'll get that big vanilla aroma. A lot of that comes from the, like you said, the oak, mm -hmm. oak beijing. Mm -hmm. um, get a little like deeper into the process it's a uh, ex-bourbon oak aged and then we do a second aging in a still oak barrel but it's rioja cask oh oh really that's super interesting yeah, oh so it is a very um oh, I sipped you... before everybody sorry oh, it's... <laughs> <laughs> Not myself. it's that good you know yeah. what um I'm interested in knowing I mean if you can let us know where you get your bourbon barrels from is it is it like Con, you know honestly we don't know okay it's totally fine um, that's kind of like totally the fine. way of the world now right yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like uh, it used to be a surplus and then now you know um uh yeah well just from, the fact that you're different. aging in yes yeah in an oak barrel sets sets you apart in general yeah and and then i had no clue that you were double aging in a rioja uh barrel whoa so that's what gives this it's unique aroma yeah, it's like sure. there's a lot of depth to it and yeah, it's knows yeah. there's a lot of layers to this this you know the vanilla for sure but then there's like mm. yeah. each person's uh palette and olfactory sensors sensors are, are a little bit different so you might be getting something different but you really can hit that toast and that that vanilla note and that flavor but for me, I'm getting like millions of things as yes. well. Um, shall we? Shall we sit? Yes, we gotta catch yes, up. Sorry. To, to, we gotta catch up now. Right. Cheers. And and you say um, how do you say cheers in uh, yeah. in the Philippines? So, cheers literally is tagay, but tagay. A popular cheers is mabuhay, which just means like to live. Mabuhay. 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 <laughs> okay, let's taste this. Oh wow! Wow. So nice. Do you get like like for me? Do you get like a little citrus, like a little orange Absolutely. peel, maybe yes, some like definitely. coriander vibe as well? Yes. It's delicious though. But like someone that's been working with the brand for five years, like what do you get from this? Um, definitely like notes of caramel. Yeah. I would say or like candied fruit. Definitely citrus as well. Mm. Um, I get a little bit banana. Yeah. Yeah. And being a, a bourbon drinker myself, I really appreciate the similarities of the vanilla and the oak and the caramel, you know, that, you know, Very could be a little bit of, yeah, it could be in my mind because I know it's coming from ex bourbon cask, but mm -hmm. those are the flavors that I'm always looking for in a strong whiskey or strong bourbon. And I, I it ticks the box for sure. Every year I get, I order a rum cake. Every uh, every year from yes. the same Jamaican um, bakery on Linden Boulevard. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a tradition of mine. I was eating it before I was 21. Like, <laughs> that's how much of a tradition it is. And um, I'm thinking this year, it's like, what if I make my own with Don Papa? I feel like this is like the perfect rum yeah. for a rum cake. We will send you a recipe. Caramel. Oh, my God. Yeah. Wait, you guys would send me yeah. like an official Don Papa rum yes. cake recipe? Yes. Can yes, it be can. black rum cake? Because there's two types. I, I love the black rum cake. Okay. Well, we'll look into yeah. it. It's it, funny. I So I graduated college in Miami, and um, obviously a lot of rum down there. And that was my 
graduation cake was a rum cake. And oh. for whatever reason, yeah, cheers. <laughs> cheers. I had kind of just assumed that it cooked off in the process. And it oh, definitely no. didn't. No. <laughs> and no. we were like, I was like my eight whole years family old. was like, ooh, we're celebrating. Yeah. I was gone off that rum cake at <laughs> eight. Oh, man. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> yeah. But really, I think this will be a really nice for for like a dessert. Yeah, this like, is a yeah. great rum for dessert. Yeah. I know some people just like pour it straight on the dessert. Yeah. Mm. Um, but I've actually done like a syrup. Mm -hmm. So in the Philippines, we have like leche flan, which is a very popular dessert and yeah. kind of has like this like sweet syrup on it. Like this. Oh, like a flan almost? Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah, same thing. In the Philippines, same, same. call it leche flan. No yeah. flan. Yeah. <laughs> well, as you know, I, I find that so interesting how, you know, each culture has something very similar to it's like um in the haitian culture there's cremas and then dominican culture there's coquito yeah, but yeah. They, they're I'm essentially do not bite my head off guys but they are essentially the same thing <laughs> uh, i mean I, hey come on guys i'm from the island i would know i've made it a million times <laughs> i've seen my mom make it i have tons of dominican friends i've seen them make coquito we won't get too deep into it but um like flan and how do you say it in the traditional Filipino language? Uh, leche flan. Le it's just oh, leche flan. Milk. Leche. Milk. Yeah. leche flan. Oh, cool. And that goes down to like the Spanish kind of influence as yes. well. Yeah. So can you speak a little bit about like the Filipino uh, national language? What's what's the, the official name for it? For what? Uh, so they speak Tagalog. Tagalog. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of a blend of languages mm -hmm. but everything in the philippines now is kind of a blend <laughs> oh are there um, some spanish words there in there so like leche spanish. is, oh, yeah. is yeah. so interesting like hmm. her last name is rojo yeah. oh wow and <laughs> tomas last night his de last name reyes. is de los reyes so and that speaks to the spanish conquering of the island oh hundreds okay of years that ago. make of course that yeah. makes sense and so that was even interesting to me because again like philippine filipinos and the Philippines was always like, I know it's different. I don't really know why. And then I realized the Spanish influence, of course. Mm. It was, you know, the crusade and the galleon trade that, and w hence why there's so much sugar cane there as well. Absolutely. Yeah, so Absolutely. it's really rich in history. And when you figure it out, you're like, oh, yeah, duh. But it's like that awareness <laughs> yeah. isn't quite there yet. And um, it does translate to the, you know, obviously, the names uh, of, of the people from the Philippines and the last names, but... It doesn't really translate much to the food, right? Because like last night when I came to your event, which was amazing, the food was insane. The drinks were insane, like, but the food was I feel like stands alone. I didn't see yeah. any Spanish influence, but maybe you can offer some more insight to this yeah, and it's educate kind of us. Hard to say like because the Philippines is so many different islands. Yeah. To say like anyone does any one dish the same as just not going to happen. So there is a lot of like staple dishes, but a lot of things are um, regional. Mm. So, I mean, I think so, what we had last night was mm. kind of fusion. Yeah. So there are certain things like the sinigang shrimp, for example, like we would never deep fry a shrimp and then put it in a tamarind sauce that actually oh, originally okay. comes from sinigang is like a soup. It's oh, a tamarind based soup. So where we were at last night was more of like a fun yeah, twist like of, twist of, of traditional, yeah. Yeah. not not as traditional. Yeah. But in the traditional dishes, do you does like the uh, the Spanish influence? Uh, is it there? Yeah, well? definitely. I would say that in Filipino food, you do see a lot of Spanish mm -hmm. um, influence. With interesting, you know, like even if you look at other Latin dishes like the stewed meat and rice yeah. Like yeah. those kinds of dishes are very common in the philippines um let's see what else but even like yeah like the desserts yeah are very oh, okay. similar like and do you mind if we jump back to shakes and and speak a little bit about because you had mentioned sugar cane yeah mm -hmm. and yeah. and i know that it's quite different from any other island when it comes down to sugar cane production you yeah. know like um your brand ambassador spoke a bit, a bit about it last night and he made an amazing point what was his name again tomas tomas um what was his full name so we can so they can oh, tomas de, you say it, you'll say it better yeah. tomas de los reyes tomas de los reyes so you guys he was very elo uh, uh eloquent last night and he had mentioned 
the sugar cane harvest and the difference between like the Caribbean sugar canes, like from Haiti and, uh, and, and other fibrous, super fibrous. Yeah. And just because the ter- terroir is different, but can you speak uh, about the sugar cane production in the Philippines and offer a little insight about the growth of, uh, the sugar cane? Um, I'll let you take it. It's, uh, what was astounding to me is, was to find out that the Philippines was the second largest sugar cane producer. In I had the world. no clue. really. Yeah. And again, that's wow. from the, the Spanish influence. Yeah. Um, just one note on the food. So I was lucky enough to go uh, just this past May for the first time. Mm. And I'm familiar with Spanish food. My mother's Cuban. And the amount of, like, chicharrones. And, mm. like, there was oh, yeah. a lot paella, but all with a Filipino-Asian twist. I was like, ooh, I know paella. I'm going to love yeah, it. Yeah. And I did love it, but it was totally different flavor profile. So Interesting. To to See, that. that's, g- yeah. that's great. That's yeah. good. Yeah. That, but like... Sorry. So to get back to the sugar oh. cane, yes. So second largest producer. Um, where we have the sugar cane, it's actually on the base of Mount Canlaon. It's a, mm-hmm. a volcano uh, in the island of Negros. You want to speak so cool. to the? I can speak to the like actual sugar cane. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, like she said, grows at the base of the volcano. So the soil is um, volcanic, which makes um, you know it's just richer soil for the sugar cane to actually grow in. But the strain of sugar cane itself is native to the Philippines, and it grows um, less fibrous than other strains of sugar Absolutely, cane yeah. with higher sucrose. Mm, so again, that makes sweeter. the plant sweeter, yeah. sweeter much yeah. richer. Oh, I want to chew on it. You know, yeah. like, yes, yes. like yeah, the, yeah, the yeah, sugar cane I'm used yeah. to is like you chew it to get the, you really got to chew and get the juices. Yep. So this is less fiber, so less less of a chew, more of the more sugar of the yield. Sugar. Yeah. So boom, I'm getting more juices, more sugar high yeah. from yeah. it. I'm enjoying more bang for my buck, <laughs> uh-huh. pretty yes, much. Yes, for sure. Mm-hmm. And that for translates sure. into the flavor profile yes, here. Absolutely. And um, what's interesting is, I you know, one would think that the volcanic soil would offer an extreme amount of like minerality. It does, yeah. So how do you, um, how do you do how do you like balance that out? Because this this is not overly sweet. This is perfectly balanced, but there's like a nice sweet note to it. Not, I mean, if you understand minerality, then you can pick up on a bit of a bit of it. To a normal consumer, they're just going to pick this up and pound it. Yeah, very true. <laughs> well, you might have more experience with Stephen, but he actually, when he was creating the flavor profiles, was looking for that um, little bit extra sweet. So all the cask finishes that we do, and there's quite a few, all air on the side of sherry cask, port cask, a little bit more of those sweeter flavor profiles. And I think that was sort of the... T- determination of wanting to age it first in ex-bourbon right get the sweetness from you know the corn of mm-hmm. the the mash and all of that yeah um but in terms of yeah i mean i've i've i don't know too much it, it was indigenous the the sugar cane mm-hmm. um but i've heard the relation between having the volcanic soil with the sugar cane same as the agave plants right there's something about that soil that just creates a really rich um product in the end yeah. Um, but yeah, but but pur- purposely, you know, on the sweeter side to, to hit that more sweeter flavor profile that Stephen was looking for. And um, I think this goes, I mean, it's so it's super malleable. That's why, like last night, we were sipping some ube uh, cocktails. Uh, ube is the purple yam uh, it's tr- native to the Philippines. And you guys made a really clever kind of play on a daiquiri with it. And I think that's cool, cool, uh, like, cool. I, I mean, I can curse on my own show. I was going to say, <laughs> I, I almost stopped myself. I, I think that's cool it's AF, cool, yeah. cool AF, awesome. you know, like, yeah. I really think that's great. So. I think ube is the next flavor. It's right? going to pop off. It's going to pop. I mean, you're seeing it in everything from culinary to chips to donuts to cookies. Uh, and it's just something we've been pushing because it makes so much sense. It's indicative of the Philippines. Yeah. It pairs so nicely. It's very, like, nutty and... The sweetness of Don Papa really balance it out. The color is beautiful as it's well. It's beautiful. That's yeah. the other thing. It's like, guys, you can put down yeah. Yeah. the butterfly PT. That's right. Put it That's down right. now. That's right. And, and now just you have can, your purple drink. You yeah, know? you can pick up some yeah. ube and make like a delicious uh, simple syrup or yeah. an infusion or maybe just, I mean, I, I think that 
it's I haven't worked with ube before. It's very so. easy, exactly as you said. So we do okay. a uh, ube simple syrup, so sugar, water, uh, and, and the extract of the yeah. ube. Boom. Boom. That's it. Purple. Beautiful purple color. <laughs> and frozen, even better. A frozen oh, really? daiquiri, a frozen colada, ube colada. Yeah. yeah. Could you speak a little bit more about your signature cocktails and and maybe like offer some some suggestions for the people at home to you know when they grab a bottle, what what can they do at home with it, you know? You want to take this? Yeah. Ooh, okay. So um, let's see. Yeah. Let's start with s- your cocktails or at home? Hmm. I mean, I love your daiquiri. <laughs> I love your play on a daiquiri, and I thought yeah. it was genius. So maybe speak about your signatures and then and then jump into something that they can do at home. You okay. Know? Mm. Um, so one of the big things we've been doing for years was the ube colada, oh. which is – the best Purple dessert the amazing. best dessert yeah. you could possibly want yeah. it's everything but um yeah. oh yes please <laughs> oh thank you <laughs> thank you yeah so a frozen ube colada um i believe it's made with like coconut cream so mm-hmm. it's like really really like nice texture um i think pineapple is the citrus in it mm-hmm. um I think that's it. I mean, you could do you could do the colada when you want something a little bit more like indulgent. Oh, of course. And then yeah. the daiquiri you had last night is just the plain, you know, citrus daiquiri, but with the ube. Um, we always say like our signature serve is neat as we're having it now. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, it's great it, like this. It really is, and yeah. even just with like a cube. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were talking before we started. I have a Negroni. I'll say now almost every night. Yeah. Um, a Negroni kick. Yeah. Is what I a like Negroni to call kick. It. Um, But it's just like, you know, the aperitivo, that's kind of what it does. But we love taking riffs on classics. So the Papa Negroni is amazing. Mm -hmm. The Papa Old Fashioned. Anything where you just want to experience with some flavors that you know, but have a, you know, get a little bored of having the same thing over and over again. So those are the two classics. Like you said, it's very versatile. Yeah. Yeah. For the classics, I do love like the Old Fashioned. Just swap out the Spiro with some Papa. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's complementary to... Filipino cuisine. Yeah. It's complementary to the fruit and veggies that are grown in the Philippines as well. Yeah. And not only that, you can create riffs on classics. I mean, I have the setup here for um uh old fashioned, but I'm sure that I can make a Don Papa old fashioned. Skip the sugar. Yeah. Right? Because mm-hmm. we don't fashion. need it. Yeah. Yeah. Don fashioned. Yeah. So that makes it a two-step old fashioned. Very true. Mm-hmm. So We've boom. become efficient. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're you're more efficient yeah. than other <laughs> brands. <laughs> I pour up my two fingers length, put some ice in there, put some bitters, do a stir, <laughs> boom. Excuse me. Don't need to add the sugar cube or anything. Oh, I don't want my fans in Kentucky to bite my head off. I do do official <laughs> old fashions with the sugar cube and a little dash of water. I know the deal. But when I'm drinking Don Papa at home, you know I've already flew through. Uh, two bottles, uh, oh. by the way. So if you'd like to send okay. some we'll my send way some more, yeah. so I can actually make some cocktails at home and yes. experiment. But you guys sent me a couple bottles. I flew through them. I gave one to a friend as well. And he, like, loves your rum. Oh, that's this amazing. is his new favorite rum. <laughs> that's amazing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Aside from it being on my shelf, which is huge yeah. as well. You know, I, I, I'm going to finish this bottle tonight with the friends. <laughs> Good. Well. It is a great um, mm. a thing to bring to parties. It's yeah. a crowd pleaser for sure. It's, it is a crowd pleaser, and there's a story. You yeah, know, yeah. there's a story behind it. It's historical. Um, there's a story. There's a visual thing happening here as well. Don Papa kind of encompasses the Filipino culture. Um, it's, it's kind of all-around brand a one-stop shop to learn more about filipino culture and it's super important that they have something that they can produce that they can you know filipino people can have jobs out there you guys can generate like i said this to uh anyone that is literally creating a product is generating jobs yeah absolutely. and i think it's necessary um have you seen have you seen that effect when you go visit the facility in the Philippines, like do you get to speak oh, with the sure. locals and are you hiring locals, I guess, at these facilities? Yeah, so um, correct me if I'm wrong, but we don't own the sugar cane fields, mm-hmm. right? So, uh, but obviously we're their very good customer. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, the better we do, the better they do. 
Yeah. Um, and there's it's almost like a collective. And so we take people out on tours. We have this really cool like steamer train that goes between the farm and the milling. That's cool. It's really cool. It actually went off the tracks the last time I was there. I still want to go on the yeah. train if it's, I get to the it more exciting. <laughs> yeah. Can and I take like, that train if I go to the Philippines? Can I like visit the facility? You have, and you have and... to pull the, the. Oh my gosh! Yes. The horn, whatever they call it. I kind of want to drive it. I kind of want to drive it. I mean, like I kind of want to drive it. It's like, like, what do I have to do? Pure like. <laughs> Filipino culture, like, goes off the track, no problem, we're going to fix it, you, yeah. you know? Like, there's nothing they can't do. So. Yeah, no stress. No, I love no that. stress. No stress. I'm more of a solution-based person myself as yeah. well. Like, when an issue arises, I'd rather focus on how we can fix it mm -hmm. rather than dwelling on, like, the issue. And yeah, say, oh, my sure. God. Right, this no is point not... getting mad. Yeah, so, they, and that's, like, the, uh, the hustle of it, you yeah. know? Like, let's just keep moving. Like, and it, it shows to how... The Filipinos are so resilient in how they pushed through this this these years of, of having to deal with this political turmoil and and really picking themselves up For sure. no matter what. And it kind of reminds me of my culture being Haitian and we produce a delicious rum as well. Uh, and, and it's quite different from from this rum. So I get to enjoy both mm -hmm. uh, sides of it and I get to explore the world. And that's why I love what I do, because I'm enjoying the, the liquid legacies that yeah. are being built and this is fresh this is new essentially this is yeah. 10 years old mm -hmm. and has the potential to last 500 years you know as yeah. long as there as long as the filipino spirit exists the people exist don papa will exist and transcend above all other brands yeah um obviously obviously there are more spirits out of the Philippines being being produced, but this was the first premium distilled single island, island. single island rum. Yeah. So yeah. that's super notable, <laughs> super notable. When it comes down to like l leaving your mark, do you have any other plans coming up? Like uh, maybe new expressions under Don Papa Definitely. or like twist? Yeah. So um, we, so again, very much in the vein of being premium and, and seeing what's resonating in terms of, you know, luxury spirits and premiumization, mm -hmm. um, you know, taking a page out of the whiskey book. So we have a lot of cask finishes, mm. which you don't really put together with a rum. Um, and one of the ones that I actually really love, um, and it's a little bit different from the rest of the flavor profiles that we do. We talked about it being edging on the sweeter side and everything we do. This one we wanted to go out on on a limb and see could we do a first fill rye cask Ooh. so what would a juxtaposition of a sweet rum yeah. distillate and the spiciness from a rye yeah um and so we have our don papa rye cask uh it's certainly one of my favorites it's limited edition so it will re-release in 2024 very small amount that sounds um, amazing yeah hopefully we can scale it up a little bit more um, but in terms of like asking core um, cocktails, so for this, like doing a um, a riff on the Manhattan mm -hmm. with the rye cask rum, um, it's really just you know, and I think we're seeing this a little bit in the category, some playing of different flavor profiles that's sweet and spicy. But for us, it's first fill in rye cask, so you're really getting that spiciness of the rye. Just super nice blend between that. And the sweet of the rum. So. Mm, that sounds amazing. Yeah, it's really good. And from a marketing standpoint, it's genius. You know, I, I haven't come across um, a rum, rye kind of like fusion that you're describing. I think that's definitely worth keeping an eye out for, for sure, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, of course, yeah, of course, of course yeah. it is. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, could you let us know a bit more about the marketing standpoint? Maybe, maybe give, like, give a little advice for us yeah. and. And then the people at home, hopefully they'll be able to take it and, and do what they need to do. Because this is like our platform is for us to mm -hmm. kind of like share more insights and sure. give them a little something. Give you guys a little something to take away and kind of be able to build something for themselves yeah. with that. You know, so I mean, you're a marketing guru. Like, how do you do like a first year campaign? Yeah, well, I think my number one piece of advice would be. You have to be patient mm -hmm. because particularly in this industry, there's so many layers. We have the three-tiered system, which means we cannot sell directly to customers. 
we have to sell to a distributor, a distributor has to sell to the accounts. So there's a lot of layers, uh, and that was the answer after prohibition, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so there's so many challenges just the way that our industry is set up. So you have to have perseverance, you have to have cash, of course, but you have to have grit because it's not easy. Grit. Yeah, mm. and you know, this brand is 10 years and, it, and, and it's done very well. We are still sort of up and coming in the US, while our European counterparts have already sort of hit like a scalable level, um, it just takes some time. So definitely grit. Um, yeah, I yeah. think the interesting in the past couple of years, what has changed the industry, um, thanks to COVID, has been e-commerce. Yes. Where you know you it's can huge. buy a shirt, a hat, whatever off of e-commerce, but when it came to alcohol sales, there's a lot of compliance things that need to be considered. Um, mm. But showing that there is a appetite for e-commerce with spirits has really helped legislation legislation sort of like a, a accelerate the possibility. So what I would say is, you know, get to know your three tiered system, make the right connections with your distributor because that's really who's going to be behind your product. Um, but don't leave it completely to the distributor because they have tons of products to sell and then really start to know your e-commerce. It's, it's really like a, a 360 or a full vertical of digital, social, um, you know, being able to sell on your website through Shopify, still hitting the three tier compliance that, you know, you can ship from different retailers, mm -hmm. um, get to know the back end of that, because that's really, especially in your first year where you'll probably get the bulk of your sales Yeah, and you know, without the sales, you can't do much. So you've got to have a great idea. You've got to have that creativity. You have to have the grit. And then you really have to know the business side and you have to respect, you know, that the distributor system has been in place for a very long time. It's probably not going anywhere. But e-commerce is a way that you can connect one on one with your consumers like never before. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's gr it's a category. This is Garvey Alexander and you're listening to Liquid Legacies. Cheers.